Why did Ian MacLeod, Secretary of State for the Colonies under Elizabeth II's government, direct that post-independence governments should not get any material that might embarrass the Queen? Welcome to the Sankofa Pan-African series. Please support us through Patreon and by buying me coffee so we can continue to bring you uh, the series. Subscribe and turn on your notification buttons if you've not yet done so. Um, of course, share our videos. Don't forget to check out our new website, SankofaStoryBooks.com for history, Afrocentric stories and other resources for our children. Now, the death of the British Queen and enthronement of Charles III should continue to ignite us as we challenge Britain's colonial past and the real legacies of their monarchy. These events should help us see past the whitewashed images of the royal family with the picture-perfect new king, prince and princess of Wales that the mainstream press keep shoving down our throats. We should not be deluded into forgetting that the lifestyle that all the members of the royal family now enjoy was founded on nothing but the toil, sweat and blood of Africa and other former colonies. It was to prevent us from ever discovering the truth about the havoc that the British, in the name of their monarchy, wrought on us that led Ian MacLeod to give the instructions in 1961. He instructed that thousands of documents detailing some of the most shameful acts of crimes committed during the final years of the British Empire under Elizabeth II should be destroyed to prevent them falling into the hands of post-independence governments. Among the documents that were destroyed were records of the abuse of the Mau Mau insurgents who were detained by British colonial authorities. These freedom fighters were tortured and some murdered. Other incriminating documents that were not destroyed were kept by colonial authorities in Aden, Yemen, where the British Army's intelligence corps continued to operate a secret torture center for several years in the 1960s. Some incriminating documents were, uh, were kept by the British authorities in Guyana, and even after the British left um, that country in 1966, the U.S., Britain's staunch ally, helped keep their secrets. The secret remained safe there because Guyana continued to be unduly influenced by successive U.S. governments and its immediate post-independence leader was even toppled in a coup orchestrated by the CIA. The documents that were not destroyed were kept secret, not only to protect the UK's reputation, but to shield the government from litigation. As such, colonial officials were instructed to separate the papers to be left in place after independence. Uh, they were usually known as legacy files from those that were to be destroyed or removed. Some of the documents to be destroyed or removed were marked as watch files and stamped with a red letter W. Some papers that were flown discreetly to Britain were hidden for 50 years in a secret foreign office archive. The archive did not come to light until a group of Kenyans who had been detained and tortured during the Mau Mau Rebellion won the right to sue the British government. The cache of documents contained over 8,000 files from 37 former colonies 
held at the highly secure government communication center at Hanslow Park in Buckinghamshire. The papers at Hanslow Park include monthly intelligence reports on the elimination of the colonial authorities' enemies. The records also show that ministers in London were aware of the torture and murder of Mau Mau insurgents in Kenya, including the case of a man, a human being, an African who was roasted alive. And yet, these people claim to be a civilizing influence on the people that they colonized. It boggles the mind. As independence grew closer in most British colonies, large caches of files were removed from colonial ministers, um, from colonial ministries to governor's offices where new safes were installed just for the purpose of keeping them concealed and safe. In Uganda, this process of concealing atrocities committed by the British government was given the code name Operation Legacy. And in Kenya, it was called a thorough purge. The process was overseen by colonial special branch officers. The, and the British government made no bones about what it was doing. And so specific instructions were issued saying that no Africans were to be involved. And I, and I quote uh, from a document from the British National Archives about their operation in Kenya. So we go, and I quote, watch materials can only be seen by authorized officers. An authorized officer is defined in the draft paragraph 9 as a servant of the Kenyan government who is a British subject of European descent. So, they were specific about the role of race on the success of their mission. Only British subjects of European descent could participate in the vetting of documents to determine which would be destroyed, removed, or left as legacy files in the colonies. The British also did not spare any effort in preventing post-independence governments from learning that the watch files had ever existed. One instruction states, and I quote again, the legacy files must leave no reference to watch materials. Indeed, the very existence of the watch files, though it may be guessed at, should never be revealed. When a single watch file had to be removed from a, a group of a legacy files, a twin file or dummy one was to be created to insert in its position. Many of the watch files that ended up at Hanslow Park came from 37 different former colonies and filled 200 meters of shelving. So what this account of the extent to which the British tried to destroy evidence of what they did to us shows us is that our calls for reparations are not just based on sentiments. Thanks for watching. Please support us through Patreon and by buying me coffee uh, so we can continue to bring you the series. Subscribe and turn on your notification buttons. Don't forget to share our videos. And please don't forget to check out our new website, sankofastorybooks.com for history, Afrocentric stories and other resources for our children. See you next time.